with you, let me encourage you to go ahead and turn to the first chapter of the book of Romans in the New Testament, and we are in verses 18 through 23 this morning. I see Chuck's parents have to use those pew Bibles, and that print is extremely tiny. I would not, well, your son bought them, so <laughs> the blame goes to him. Yesterday, KK and I traveled over to Shreveport, and we went to a arts and crafts fair that's in Shreveport uh, that happens every year. And there were some uh, magnificent uh, paintings, all original artwork and uh, crafts, those not so much crafts, more, more of the artwork. And it was marvelous to look at. And that got me to thinking, as a painter, how would I paint best the color white? Well, here's how you do it. You'd paint a canvas black and then the white would show up against the black, and that's exactly how it's done. Well, today, the Apostle Paul, in an effort to show the brilliant clarity and beauty of the righteousness of God that is received from faith unto faith, paints the canvas black. For the balance of chapter 1, he will paint the canvas black. Today, we're only going to, going to go through half of this section, which rightly runs from verses 18 through verse 32. But in that blackness, I, I, I don't want you to not get in touch with that. For it is reality. It is reality apart from Jesus Christ. And what I want you to understand is that just as God has made evident the righteousness of Christ through faith, he has also made evident the blackness of man's heart. What we're going to see today is the beginning of a descent a beginning of not evolution, but devolution. We're going to see man uh, in his natural state reject God and reject God's revelation time and time again until he reaches a point where his eyes are darkened. We're going to, we're going to look ahead into verses 24 through 32 and you're going to hear a bell toll three times. And you're going to see the phrase, God gave them over. Now, as tough as it is to hear that, for the believer, <clears throat> for the believer, it should cause you to praise God that he did not leave you there. It should cause you to rejoice that you have been shown, you have been shown favor and that God has opened your eyes. He's given you a heart to, to, to believe. He's given you a will to follow. So you've had the passage read to you earlier, and I apologize for my voice. I've got a little something going on, but I want you to see that this passage today it divides itself, I think, pretty neatly into three sections. First of all, you find verse 18, and there you see the revelation of the wrath of God. Then verses 19 and 20, you see the revelation of the knowledge of God. And then verses 21 through 23, the rejection of the knowledge of God. So we go to the passage, and indeed, we begin to take it apart. It says... Uh, once I get there, I'll tell you what it says. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. So he says here in this very first 
very first place, we see, the, we see this process of revelation. Uh, the word there, uh, when it says, is revealed from heaven, take note that that's a present tense. In other words, it is ongoing. So the wrath of God wasn't just revealed back in the time of Romans or back in the time of, uh, of the Old Testament, but it still is being revealed. God is revealing, he is exposing to light his wrath. Now, what is that? What, is, what does wrath mean? Well, let me tell you first of all what it's not. Uh, when my young daughter was, our, our youngest daughter, Abby, was uh, a little girl, about four or five, she was playing soccer. Uh, now, in those days, they played on these little fields, and you could wander all around the edge of the field. And so I happened to be on the back edge, and, and she was playing, and she was playing this little girl. And this little girl was just shoving her and doing this to her. And I'd had enough, and I finally said, Abby, sweep her legs. I know, it was sinful. But that was uncontrollable, an, an uncontrollable outburst of anger. That's not what this means. This word means, let me read, it, let me read you what John Murray, the great uh, theologian, said. He said, it is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness. You see, God is holy, and anything that is not holy, he has a revulsion against it. It pushes against that. If it is not holy, the wrath of God is against that. So it says here in the verse that the wrath of God is being revealed. Now, where is it coming from? Well, look, it says, from heaven. You might ask, how? How is his wrath being revealed? Look at verse 24. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Look at verse 26. For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to the debased mind to do what ought not to be done. God gave them up, God gave them up, God gave them up. The wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And how is that done? By God giving them up, giving them up, giving them up. Now, we as a nation, probably there is no more applicable passage to us at this present time. Who would have thought we would live to see a day that not only would we say what is wrong is okay, we would make federal law that says it is their right as a human. No, that is not what the Word of God says. But the wrath of God is being revealed. God cannot abide unholiness. He has revealed righteousness from faith for faith, but he is also revealing his wrath. So what we see in this passage is this devolution all the way down. Well, what are the objects of that revelation of wrath? Well, it tells us. He uses two words ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Now, there's a technique in uh, Greek language that you can use two words to mean one thought. That's probably what is going on here. So the two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, probably refer to the same thing, but, but there does seem to be a shade of difference, at least. The word ungodliness usually is used to uh, describe an attack on the majesty of God. It, it's religious in nature. In other words, it's idolatry. In other words, it's a violation of the first four commandments, of the Ten Commandments. 
And then the word unrighteousness seems to be a violation of God's just order in society. In other words, it's moral perversity. In other words, it's the last six commandments of the Ten Commandments. But what you see is if there is sin in idolatry, there is going to be sin in activity. You cannot worship wrongly and not end up in moral pollution. It cannot be. It cannot be. And so God's wrath is against both idolatry and perversity of the living. Now you say, well, I don't see people getting hurt. Well, we'll see more next week uh, that they become more and more set in their ways, and that's clearly leading to their damnation. We'll get into that more. But folks, let me, let me <clears throat> make sure you understand. Don't sit there and piously think, well, that's for them and not for me. That's the mistake the Jews are making as Paul begins to write Romans. And they think that that's right for the Gentiles, but not for them. You see, all of us were just like that. God's wrath was revealed against us. Because if you don't worship God in the way he has described himself and revealed himself in the Bible, then you're guilty of what? You've made a God of your own, of your own uh, thoughts and imaginations, and you're worshiping that God. And if that's the case, then there was going to be a breakdown in your lifestyle. You see, it's a whole package. When idolatry is taken care of, and you worship God in the way he has revealed himself, then your life is going to conform to what he said. But the wrath of God is against that which is not. And so that's it. And he says, and then he gives the reason for that revelation of wrath. It says, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now this is kind of one of these funny things that you find in the scriptural language. Imagine a giant uh, coil and it sits, uh, let's say it sits over a manhole, and there's a cover, on, uh, there's a lid on the top of that coil, and you're supposed to push that lid down to hold it over the manhole. Well, the idea is the coil is so strong, you can never do it. And so what this means is they suppress, but the tense, uh, or the, the, the tense of the verb here means they're never successful. They, it, it never works out. So they try to cover up and suppress their unrighteousness, but it's always leaking out. It always, it always shows up. Listen to what people say and watch what they do, and that will tell you who they worship. It will tell you what they're about. And so here we see this revelation of God's wrath against those who unsuccessfully try to suppress their unrighteousness and ungodliness. Now, he begins in verse 19, and in verse 20, he's going to talk about the revelation of the knowledge of God, or why Paul can say man unsuccessfully tries to suppress the truth of God. For what can be known about God is plain to them, for God has shown it to him. To them. In other words, it's evident. What can be known about God is evident. You don't have to learn Greek and Hebrew to understand who God is. You don't even have to unlearn Southern English to understand who God is. God has made it evident who he is. He's made it plain is another way he said that. Now, when it says that uh, it is plain to them, literally it means in their midst. In other words, all around them, they see that. It, 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 is, it is something God has provided. And then verse 20, the first part says, not only is it evident, it's clear. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Who God is that you can't see is also understood. In other words, his eternal power, and he defines that. What does that mean, his eternal power? His omnipotence, his 
eternity. What does divine nature mean? It means the full revelation of his majesty and glory. This is clear. And it began with creation ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, starting with the creation and through the creation. Listen to what Calvin said about this, this verse. He said, by saying that God has made it manifest, he means that man was created to be a spectator of this formed world and that eyes were given to him that he might, by looking on so beautiful a picture, be led to the author himself. Idolatry leads to a profane lifestyle. And they unsuccessfully try to suppress their ungodliness and unrighteousness. Why? Because God has revealed himself and they've rejected it. They have turned from it. As a result, you get to the last part of verse 20. It says, so they are without excuse. I'm going to make a sound to see if you recognize where it's from. Dun, dun. The TV show Law and Order. I mean, it's a very definite kind of uh, sound. And the show revolves around a crime being committed, the police uh, getting together and finding who committed that crime, and then the legal system uh, applying the justice to that crime. When they've caught you red-handed, you don't have an excuse. And what he's saying here is that man has no excuse. Man who rejects God and turns to idolatry is without excuse because God has made himself known. God has clearly made himself known. In other words, man is supposed to look out and see the reality of God's creation and know that God is. But think about our society. What happened about a month ago, some of you here in this audience spent uh, hundreds of dollars to get in a car and to go drive to see about a minute and a half or two minutes worth of something. All right, the total eclipse of the sun. Now, if you were watching TV and you were, and I was, I, you were watching the Weather Channel, did they say, oh, the majesty of God? No, Mother Nature. So instead of seeing what God is making evident, they reject it. They, they turn from it. Let me give you another instance. I think a couple of uh, you in this room are physicists, uh, are on the way to becoming a physicist. So you will know what this word means, quark. Now, for the rest of you, you've got to take it, you gotta take it on faith. I mean, they sit over there in the physics department and they kind of go quark, 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 quark. And they build the whole existence of the universe on the quark, 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 quark. Uh, a quark is real, but guess what? Nobody can, has ever seen a quark in isolation. Nobody has ever seen a quark just alone. It has to be there because it holds uh, another physics lesson, and I'm going to stop right there. I was a health and physical education major. Uh, you know, I can't go, be, I, you know, that's all. I can't go to physics. But that's, that's it. But they believe in it. They believe in it, but they won't believe in God. In other words, they won't see the beauty of nature, the beauty of creation, and they don't see God. So God says they're without excuse. The question comes up. What about the person in some undiscovered land who has never had the gospel preached to them? Are they lost? From the revelation of Scripture, yes. 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 You see, the deal is they're not going to go to hell because they've rejected the gospel. They'll go to hell because they've rejected the one that has been shown to them, God. And he said, well, that's harsh. That's cruel. 
All right, be careful. This is what God has revealed in the Scripture. This is the way God reveals himself. And if you reject the way God reveals himself, then you're guilty of idolatry. You see, sometimes we don't understand everything in the Scripture, but that doesn't mean I don't place myself under the authority of that Scripture. So is natural revelation sufficient, though, to save somebody? No. For salvation, man must look to Christ as he is revealed in the Scriptures. Now, in answer to that first question, I have heard missionaries talk about going into uh, un charted lands and coming across people who have been waiting for a message about God, about the Redeemer, and and tribes have turned to Christ as a result of that. But I just want you to understand that this is part of the slide is God has revealed his wrath, but man has rejected the revelation of God. And not only that, but he rejects the knowledge of God. Let's keep going. Verse 21, for although they knew God, In other words, they could see God. They knew him. They were aware of him. They did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. They failed to acknowledge God. When we see God and we're aware of what he's doing, we should always respond in worship and thanksgiving to what God has revealed to us in Christ. We're going to take the Lord's Supper very soon. It's also called the Eucharist. What does Eucharist mean? Joy. Joy over what? Joy over what God has revealed to us in Christ. But man, instead of bending his knee and bowing in worship, stiffens his back and shakes his fist in the face of God. So you end up with someone like Stephen Hawking crippled, maybe perhaps the most brilliant intellectual mind of our generation, but shakes his fist in the face of God. He's an exact embodiment of what this scripture says. So, Failure to acknowledge God is part of the rationalization process. Futile speculations, that word means to be given over to worthlessness, to to think about idle things, worthless things. It is the failure to direct the focus of the mind toward God and to place in worship. The word thinking refers to conversations the mind has with itself. Having rejected God, man's intellect then turns to inventing Religious methods of idolatry. In other words, false religions. So when they reject God, they have to replace God. So that's where you get Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Scientology, Christian science, Olsteinism. I'm serious about that. It's a false religion. It is an idolatrous kind of thing. But you see, when you reject God, something has to fill the vacuum. Maybe it's the worship of science itself. But when you reject God, you will turn to idolatry. And once that has happened, the slide quickens into damnation. Verse 21, foolish hearts are darkened. The heart is that which is hidden from view. It's where the intellect, the... uh, volitional and emotional processes occur. In other words, his immaterial part is without understanding, doesn't have insight. Doesn't mean he doesn't have the ability to use his, his, uh, his intellectual facilities, but it is now behind a veil of darkness. There are probably some people out here who have had cataract surgery. I've got one in my eye, and it's like it's got a, it's like it's smeared. Everything's hazy. That's exactly what's going on here. When you they reject God, a haze just it just blurs. A 
that's where I was before God revealed his righteousness to me in Christ. That's where you were. That's where people are. This morning, how many people do you know that just in your friend group are not in church? How many? Untold numbers. They will do anything other than worship God. Other, other than worship Christ. And so here is the beginning or a statement of their doom. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Claiming to be wise with worldly wisdom, they become fools. The creator is exchanged for the creation. By the corrupt, of the corrupt. So that slide, it begins with revelation, then there's rejection, then there's rationalization, then there's religion, and then there's reprobation. And we're going to get to that next week. So the rejection of God's general revelation in nature is reason, is reason for their reprobation, reprobation or God's wrath. When man rejects the revelation of God and instead worships crystals, whales, spotted owls, old growth forests, or mother nature. And this passage also reminds us that we can't escape the curse of God that occurred when Adam fell. We cannot escape that curse except through Jesus Christ, except that God comes to us in grace and takes the cataracts off of our eyes. So the very reality that we are able to look upon the revelation of God around us is evidence that he has loved us and he has given us what we did not possess at our birth, the capacity to worship him. The very fact that I can look up and see the heavens at night, the very fact that as I'm driving to work in the morning, when I'm going one direction, I can see Venus rising in the sky and I look at the other direction and I can see the moon. And then after about 45 minutes, I see the sun coming up and my heart says, oh God, how great you are. That very fact shows me that God has given me that gift of grace and that I can do it. It's God that has given that to me. Because if God wouldn't have done it, I would just say, boy, Mother Nature is really cool. There's a book, I mean, there's a hymn. We're actually going to sing this as our closing hymn, but I want to read the words to you. Written by Stuart Hine. O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Ah, oh, Father, we were in darkness. We could not see you. We deserved to be in darkness. For we didn't look and see you and acknowledge you as God. But in your grace, you came to us. You took the scales off of our eyes. 
And where we once were blind, we now saw. Father, please, please do the same thing for those that walk in blindness this day. Please, Father, open their eyes. You command them to believe, and yet they cannot believe unless you do your work in their life. So, Father, we give you glory for what you've done in ours. And yet we pray for those who do not know what we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Take your hymn.